All right, gang. Oh, um, today I want to help you. Uh, well, let's review the rest of the course we've got today. I want to help you with the homework and discuss more on that bifurcation thing, which is really interesting. Um, we have Wednesday, our last day of class, at which time I will um, a review. No new material, just review. I'll tell you what to expect on the final, I guess, and things like that. Finals are pretty weak this way, you know. True, false. Which of the pictures has a taxi in it? Mm. Eh, you know, whatever. Um, let's see. Get away here. Participants, what the heck? Chat. Uh, what am I trying to do now? Um, okay. Well, I don't know where it is now, but anyway, I'm not even sure if y'all can hear me anymore, but um. We can hear Stop sharing. Anyway, um, I just put an um, a email on the announcement on the thing. The exam is on Friday from 1 to 3, and the SSD students have 1 to 5. I'm getting um, a number of, you know, convenience requests, and no convenience requests will be, accept, will be even considered. You know, if you got something officially through the university and the university sends a message to me, you know, um, you know, legally mandating something, I'll... I'll of course, it accommodated, but you know, uh, uh, you know, my whatever, you know, just don't waste your time. There will be no convenience changes of any sort for anyone. Okay, it's all maddening. I I know the whole thing is maddening, but it's maddening to to me too. So, all right. Screen share. I guess we'll share this, and. Chapter, which chapter is that? Nine. All right. A few words about the homework problems. Nine seven is a pendulum. As derived in the text. Uh, what you do is you sum the moments about the pivot point of the pendulum. And this is the angular acceleration. Theta is the angles, that's the angular acceleration. It had mass moment of inertia, which has been divided through. So you sum the moments about the pivot point and the moment is caused by the gravity. And what makes the pendulum different um, than the typical problem is this term right here. This one right here the sine of theta, because the, um, the moment caused by the weight is always varying, and that distinguishes it from the linear oscillator. And so this is a really interesting problem. You're asked to compare the, the real pendulum with the linear approximation. Notice that the sine of theta, notice that the sine of theta is approximately theta for small angles. In other words, this, 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 this approximation is like the grandfather clock. The thing is, you know, pendulum with very small angle and it's very linear like and so you have to reformulate as first order equations and draw the cause and effect which I always like to, to do and then compute compute and compare the linear linear and nonlinear models and it's pretty it's interesting when you get to things like looking at the initial angle 99% of the way, when the, when the angle is pi, the thing is straight up. When the angle is zero, the angle, uh, the thing is hanging straight down. So when the angle is pi, it's, it's straight up. And here's 99% of pi. And it's interesting how subtle these equations are. You get your linear one. There's a lot to learn from this. This The pendulum, there's so much to learn from the pendulum. You can make almost a whole course of special cases and 
um, things to learn from the pendulum, but uh, you, you learn how subtle things are um, as far as dynamics are concerned. The linear oscillator never causes too much trouble. But anyway, it's a really, really interesting problem. It's a great problem. Please do a good job. And the other guy to solve is, is also interesting. The skydiver. If you do F equals MA on the skydiver when he's out there floating around there, uh, you get the mass times the acceleration. The mass has been divided here in this dynamics equation. And the mass times acceleration is mg minus the drag force. Now, it's been observed that the drag is proportional to approximately velocity squared. That is, we all know that the faster you go, the more resistance to motion you're going to get. Uh, but it, it, it's experiments and things have, have, have indicated, and some analysis indicated it's approximately V squared. This means if you stick your hand out the car window at 30 miles an hour driving down the road when you're a kid and your parents go, get your hand in the damn window. Anyway, barring that. So, you know, stick your hand out the window straight out 30, 30 miles an hour. Okay, you've got to have a certain force, you know, certain torque to hold your arm out there. Well, do it at 60. You know it's more but it's approximately four times more, not double. 60 is double, double 30, according to my calculations. But the force you need is not double, it's more like four times. Anyway, this is, the, whether it's perfect or not, this is the model, okay, for your homework problem. It's a, it's a darn good model, by the way, but it doesn't matter if it is or not, this is your homework problem. CD is the drag coefficient that relates V squared to acceleration. To, to mass times acceleration. Now, the model here, well, a subtlety in the model is this down here. When you're in free fall, the drag coefficient is small, this number here. But when the parachute opens, you have much, much more surface area, you have much more frontal area. And now the drag coefficient jumps up to a much bigger number, five, it jumps up by a factor of 20 in, in according to these, according to the, the values given here. And it's that's the mathematics of why the parachute is going to help you from barreling down to earth and, and surely perishing. Okay. And so part of your solution has to, you, you know, you have to put in a drag coefficient into your solution, but it has to be a function of time, right? And so when you call on your different, and you're going to call on OD45, I would assume, you, of course, can, if you've written your own Euler or, or if you've written your own runge cut of four, which is, you know, back when I was in school and started graduate school, I wrote my own runge cut of four and had, I had punch cards and some things to use. Um, now that we're in my office, we're going to stop sharing. Look at me. I hope you can see me again. I just got off my rack something called punch cards. What these were, what these are, were, is these pieces of paper with holes in them. You see, they got holes in there. And when you wanted to make something like an A, the pad, the whole pattern for an A was something and a B and a one and a two and all the symbols. And so you put an optical reader, it would shine light through these things and read your card, you know, X equals, you know, C sub C D equals five, C D open equals five, C D closed or whatever equals 0.25, you have to put all the steps in here. And um, you turn these cards into um, some administrator, you usually do it in the middle of the night because one run could take five hours. Can you imagine waiting five hours to know you have a little comma error and then have to wait another five hours? Anyway, 
what would come back to you, I'm glad I saved some of these. I threw most of these away, is these great big printouts. See this? These great big printouts. Anyway, it goes on and on. Jesus has a big one. A lot of data on there. Anyway, we do it that way. So glad. I almost threw all of that away. I'm so glad I have a small sample of my work from the Paleozoic era. And, um, you know, yeah, you do it. If and while and all that stuff. But even a couple years before that, now, right then we were actually using computers, but before that, I think this one is my father-in-law's, but um, this is called a slide rule, and this is how you make computations. I can't remember how to do it now, but whatever. I have an office with my, I have a, I have a, a shelf in my office of historical implements that we used to use back in back in my day, back when we had to walk to school five miles in the snow both ways uphill. But I have implements like that. Like I've got a rack, I've got an Iron Maiden over here. What have I got? Stock and what do you call those things where you put people in, the, put their head and their, their arms together in the public square. I got all sorts of junk like that, okay? For students who complain. Anyway. So, what the hell was I even saying here? Yeah, anyway. Anyway, back to here, you know, um, this problem would have been very difficult. Today, but I, I wrote my own, oh, I was going to say this. I wrote my own Runjakutta 4, fourth order Runjakutta using those punch cards. And I had a little card deck I'd st st stick in there when I wanted that that function, that that uh, uh, function to be executed because it has to run it to know know about it. And I did it that way, and it was cool writing my own. But now you've got OD45, a very, very sophisticated version of it. You get instant feedback. You don't understand the mansion you all live in. Of course, if all you do is live in a mansion and then you have to live in a normal home, you think it's terrible. But that when the first time I saw it, uh, you know, could put things in electronically, then wait for that damn paper to come back. I thought it was the greatest thing. First time I ever saw whatever, you know, I thought it was the greatest thing whatever anyway you guys have to mess with this i showed you how to put in a variable something that time time varies in space i mean time, time varies in time i did it i think in conjunction with uh, an, um, a time varying input that is a time varying force or a bunch of pulses and stuff like that anyway without working the whole problem for you just let me say the cd function has to be a function of time and you have to do it the way I showed you, where you put in, I believe, a, a, a variable force. A little bit different, but the same kind of idea how you put it in there. Again, you could write your own run to cut a four, or run to, you know, run to cut a, you know, Euler if you like. Those things are cool. Anyway, then you have to look, and T open should probably be one of your parameters in your C sub D function because you want to open the thing at 0, 5, 10, and 20, you know. I mean, some sissy like me might jump out of the airplane and go, oh, oh, hell with this. I'm pulling the parachute. And some of you daredevils would go 20 seconds or more, you know, barreling down at uh, terminal velocity. You know, all you thrill seekers want, want a big rush out of life, you know. What the hell, you only live once. That chute doesn't open yet, it's in it too. Anyway, kind of a fun problem. It's an awfully fun problem. And I think the results, when you finally get them, make sense. And one of those things, you know, it's sort of satisfying because it's tricky in a way because of the C sub D. And it's just, just a fun, good little problem in dynamics, I think. Okay. Next on the agenda is... Homework nine, this problem here. Now, 
There it is. So you have these two differential equations. You have two, two basically special cases. You got to find all the fixed points and you got to find if there's any kind of a critical point and identify it. Now, these identifications are just kind of characteristics. They're not like an equate, well, an exact formula gets it to you. You know, it's just kind of the way the thing looks. And I supposed to classify them, their stability according to things. So let's look at the, um, I'll do this one. Okay, here's the text again. And go to section 10.4. These nonlinear systems. I guess I'll put this one in closer. And certain kinds of nonlinear systems can go through some very interesting and important physical changes. Um, certainly, flowing fluids go from laminar to turbulent, an extremely important characteristic change. You know, you get a nice slow laminar flow and it starts to tumble and turn and go turbulent, very important. All sorts of changes in physical systems as parameters change. Those things are called bifurcations. The, the buckling is a classic there, I have it here. This is the, where the hell it go? The straw that broke the camel's back one. Um, I'm just going to do it this way. And buckling, basically, you know, you... Um, I want to show me... I'm going to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Buckling. I'm in my office today because my computer was about out of electricity and I wasn't aware of it. Um, anyway, here's a beam, right? So, oh God. my little props and my little things are so much more effective in real life. So there, there's a beam, and let's see, you can't really see it very well. You can't see it there. We need a dark background. Anyway, yeah. anyway, you got a beam and you push on it here. on it and it squeezes squeezes down push a little hard and, and it squeezes more but eventually you push so hard that it buckles mm -hmm. so squeezing a little hard doesn't just just compress it more it buckles it out to the side that's a classic bifurcation obviously an important one Ooh. And an important one in engineering in general, and of course for mechanical engineers who work with a lot of mechanical, structural, and thermal systems. Okay. So, these equations in here are sort of the most simplistic mathematical version of one you can have. And, and the way, what you do with this, if the derivative of x, for instance, is um, if the derivative of x here is equal to r plus x squared, where r is a parameter, r is, is maybe like, although this equation won't, will lead to something different than buckling kind of phenomena, r would be typically a, some kind of a the system parameter or external force. So R might be the force at which you're pressing down this thing. Note that this, for this thing to have any kind of a fixed point or steady state, that must be zero, which means, and clearly that's at x plus or minus net minus r, square root of minus r. So clearly for r, is a, when r is a positive number, there are no real valued steady states here, or r must be negative. 
And you can look at that pretty easily because everybody can plot r plus x squared. You determine r equals zero seems to be a critical point, And there's no reason you can't put in your computer and put like r equals like minus one or something or whatever I have in this, probably minus about three quarters or whatever I have in there. Uh, put in a little r is negative and plot the thing. And you can clearly see that there for r negative, there are two steady, there are two steady state points. One of them is, is stable because its derivative here is negative, or you can do your little stability thing. And the other one is unstable. When r crosses zero, you get this critical transition. And when r becomes greater than zero, there are no fixed points. The thing just explodes, then blows up. It'll blow up as far as away from its current steady state. It'll go probably, it'll either come crashing down. The system will either come crashing down or it'll go to another steady, another kind of physical steady state. The, the beam, when it buckled, didn't just completely break at that particular instant. It went to a little bowed shape, you know, so that's, but the, the current shape was, was gone. And um, so you got like that. So that's the current. So what you do is when you have an equation, you try to find its, you try to find its fixed points. Where is it zero? This one's pretty easy. Based on that, then you do a little stability analysis to find, and, and you, find, you find a critical value. How do you find it? Because it's where, where the fixed points are created, created or destroyed or change their characteristics. R equals zero is clearly a point where two fixed points are created. When R is positive, there are no real values. I mean, if, if X represents position or if X represents a physical parameter, temperature, velocity, voltage, um, what were we just looking at? You know, the number of people in a um, population model. Negative, you know, negative people doesn't make, and a complex, you know, the number of people in the, the virus model from last time being the square root of minus one times 10. I mean, how many people is that? I mean, if you tell me there's 10,000 people, I know what that means. I know how to, if I wanted to take the time, I could count them. But when the number of people is 1,000 times the square root of minus one, I mean, how many folks are there, you know? You see, so, so the equations have changed, changed their characteristics. And the nonlinear equations can do this. The linear ones cannot. The nonlinear ones are certainly some of the more pertinent ones, I think. So here's a type called the saddle node. And you, you could you simply plot it like this and look, see? And here's some corresponding numerical solutions created with the computer, created with ODE 4 5 type, type of sun. I think I probably created these with Mathematica, but it's got a solver. It's similar to ODE 4 5. Um, and you can see here the, the fixed point is there, the, the stable fixed point. So everything's going there. Now above, above this unstable fixed point, things explode, probably go out to some other place. So, and this is what now, this is what I call a bifurcation diagram. And it's not too difficult to draw. You've now discovered the information that for R greater than zero, there aren't any, there are no fixed points. They don't exist. There's none to report. For R less than zero, there's two of them to report. This one here, the negative one, and then the, the positive one. Now, what I did was I plotted these as two different functions and I made the line type solid here, the solid line indicating that it's a stable fixed point. And I told the computer to make this a dashed line, the unstable one. And you, you know how to man MATLAB, you put the little, you know, quote and you know, whatever, oh, that's, don't go there over that again. You know, you, you know how to make solid lines and dash lines in that in that lab. I suppose you could color code them. I think the dash is a, is a way to show unstable. And uh, that's a bifurcation diagram. And that gives you all the information about what the system could possibly do. When this parameter R is too big, it'll never find one of these stable, one of these points. Things have gotten too big to something. And it's a lot of info. This is not the complete transient history, but there's a lot of information in this plot right here. Anyway, we've got ones like, like this laser one, which I thought was really cool. We end up with a differential equation that looks like this. All right. And N is the number of photons in the laser field. We would talk about this in class, but Whatever it represents, actually, mathematically speaking, is not really relevant. It looks like a form like this. The derivative of n 
changes by some number times n minus another number times n squared. And we found that that particular form leads us to, a, to a situations that look like this. And it's really very interesting because the sign of this thing right here makes a big difference. What it means physically is either there's a, min, a, a minimal amount of loss or there's enough power added to the system so that the system can form a laser. If there's not, it'll just be incoherent light and be a lamp. The supercritical, now the pitchfork ones, that, and people come up with, the nonlinear dynamicists like to come up with fancy names for stuff. Again, the name is not so important as the mathematical characteristic, but I do think if you give things names, it kind of look like it, it helps people remember them and maybe makes it a little bit more interesting to have an interesting name rather than mathematical case three or something like that, you know. Call your word, call your files, don't call them untitled three, untitled thing, call them, you know, something more like what they are. But anyway, if you have this equation now, now rx minus x cubed, the derivative is this one. Again, you have to find where this thing is zero. Well, you can see by factoring that x equals zero is one of the fixed points. And then you have a quadratic equation for the other two. So what you do is you find, you find here that there are um, three fixed points. And if you look at them carefully, once again, once you find that r, and r equals zero makes a difference on whether the, the quadratic ones exist, you can see because the plus or minus the square root of r, well, if r is a negative number, they don't exist in this case. So you can, now that you have that information that r equals zero is a critical parameter, you can kind of form a phase plot for r less than the critical one. And you see that there's only one fixed point and it's stable. You cross, here's the, here's the threshold where you cross and then you cross over to here. And now you find that this zero goes unstable and these other two symmetric points become stable. This, this is the classical buckling mechanism where you push, when r is small enough, you're pushing down and you just, you've got zero, the, the straight up you know, position is stable. And all of a sudden the straw that breaks the camel's back and all of a sudden it's gonna to buckle to one of these symmetric states because it'll buckle you know, left or right depending just on the details of how you did it. But it could easily buckle one way or the other. So this mathematical model, this is the prototype for the buckling problem and many other mathematical problems. And if you plot it, if you plot that information, if you just plot the fixed points and with the information that some of them are stable and make those solid lines and some are unstable, make those dashed lines. You end up with a, a bifurcation diagram that looks like this. And, and that you can see probably, well, that surely is why it got its name, the pitchfork bifurcation, because here, the bifurcation diagram looks like a pitchfork, you see. I had the computer put these other lines, you know, these are, these are where, uh, if the X happens to be sitting at this spot, it's heading this way, it's heading this way. I put the little, little stability arrows in here. You don't have to worry about putting those. I have you know, software to automatically do it for me. But with this information, you can all can easily make a solid line and a dash line for certain points to indicate you know, where they are. There's the classic pitchfork. That's a beautiful one. The, when, you when you just change the sign or you put in, say, a fifth order term like this, and so we won't go too much, but you can you can have all sorts of fancy physics like a fifth order term, and when you put in something like a fifth order term, term you get all sorts of crazy things, and you can get um, um, hysteresis and a lot of very interesting mechanic mechanical things, but also psychological psychological issues. Uh, differential equations these days and over the years have been modeled. You know, I grew up or the differential equation being like a spring mass or a thermal system, you know, which is great. And those are still age old and those are still fantastic systems. But people, you know, in, in the days have obviously uh, used them a lot for biological systems. Um, certainly currently, currently um, they're being used, of course, actively around the world for, the, for you know, the, the virus thing. We showed that in class a couple of days ago and many, many other things. I saw um, you run into, you know, how uh, there's uh, one guy was doing a thing called a, he called it a Romeo and Juliet. He, he uh, 
modeled effects. He modeled human emotion. He called it Romeo and Juliet. And when R was the Romeo and J was the Juliet, when J was positive, that means she loved Romeo or liked her. That was the degree of her love for Romeo. Negative was her degree of which she couldn't stand the son of a bitch. Same for Romeo. And, and they would de develop differential equations with the interaction between Romeo and Juliet. I thought it was very creative and very interesting. And depending on the parameters you put in there, you know, you could have one of those Jerry Springer relationships where they get all mad and throw the TV out of the trailer, curse at each other and make up, you know, or, or all sorts of different relationships. So I thought this is very interesting that you can apply differential equations to something as complex as human emotion. And it was just a model, granted, just like your predator and prey was just a beginning model, but it was definitely getting, getting on target with some of the things that people actually experience. My virus model the other day was, was on target with what we needed to do. It needs a few more real world parameters in there and it needs parameter estimation for like the infection rates but it was getting at um, an intelligent modeling, I think, of a very complex system. Anyway, you probably will model the kind of things I modeled, you know, the good old spring masks and things, which are, will, are age old and will always continue to be fantastic, uh, fantastic and interesting systems for us to study. Um, now, the one you had here, since we're on here, we'll go here. Yeah, come on, 13, one, there it is. All right. Now, first of all, like the first one, okay, can anybody define the fixed points of the first one? Is, is there an obvious fixed point that's in there somewhere? Zero. Zero, because this whole thing has to be a zero. So X equals zero is clearly one of them. But also the other way is for this whole expression here to be zero, right? So what you, you know, yeah, you have to do some algebra probably. You have to multiply one plus X squared times both sides. If that equals zero, multiply by one plus X squared to get that out of the denominator, and then you end up with a quadratic. So you're gonna end up with, you're gonna end up with zero and you're gonna end up with a, co a quadratic, just an x squared, and just x squared too, x squared equals plus or minus. Damn, that's looking awful much like the thing. That, and and that, that to me, when we got zero and you got those other two points and if you plot them, it's looking awful much like the uh, buckling problem to me. But anyway, we'll let's see, see what it comes out to be. So is it clear how you find the fixed points? Like in the first one, not to work the whole problem for you, but in the first one, there's going to be zero and there's gonna probably be two, there's gonna be two more from a quadratic out of that one. And you've got to find a critical value at which a change occurs. And that's probably, there's gonna be a square root in there. So you're gonna, there's gonna be an R critical at which the square root becomes the, what do you call it, the discriminant? What's, or what's, uh, what do you think they got under the square root? What do you call that? Anyway, where, where the solution gives you complex numbers. When the solution changes from real numbers, which are applicable, for temperature, pressure, you know, number of people, et cetera, like that, to complex in which they don't, they are mathematically true, but they have no application to a mechanical system with real numbers. And that will change, that, that, that condition will change as this critical value of R changes. That being maybe some kind of an applied force becomes too large, something else becomes too small, some other parameter, input parameter or system parameter changes such that the system changes, as the system buckles, buckles under pressure. Okay, and so that, that's what I say, it's, not, it's, not, it's not, not so critical, you know, physically to know that it's called one of these, but I just think it's interesting and it rings a bell. Like when, when to me now, after looking at these for quite a few years, when somebody will say a super critical pitchfork, it brings an image, it brings the image of that pitchfork and things in my mind, rather than remembering case three or something like that. And when the trans critical, I kind of remember about the, a little bit about the equation, I remember about the laser and stuff like that. I think to me, it helps if I can key into uh, some applications there, you know. Anyway, you then classify the fixed points. Um, 
I guess the, the formal way to do it would be to do the derivative back in section um, 10.1 where you take the derivative, et cetera. But if you just plot the thing, once you find a critical value, if you plot the phase diagram a little bit below, a little bit above and at the critical value, you'll, you, can, you can look on the graph and see the stability. Although if this was a problem for collection, which it's not, I'm not collecting it, I would ask you to take the derivative and do the mathematical version of it. Um, and certainly, and if this was more like a beginning graduate class, I'd have to do all the math there. Anyway, sketch, so plot, I would say plot now, since there, there's no sense in doing a little hand. Well, a hand sketch is always kind of cool, but you do have this powerful tool at your disposal, MATLAB, just a beautiful, beautiful tool where PLOT is very easy to use. So I would use MATLAB to help me plot a bifurcation diagram and then sketch the pace portraits and corresponding solutions. Now this would be this would be the equivalent of doing what I did over here, like, let's go to it again. Mm -hmm. Let's say that first case is a supercritical fit pitchfork. It's certainly looking like it to me. I think it'll come out to having these kinds of characteristics. Well, it's easy enough to plot these top figures, right? Because it's just a simple algebra plot. To create these bottom figures though, it takes a little bit of doing because you have to uh, run the slip to start the solution, say at minus one and plot it in a different starting condition and plot it. So um, I wouldn't require you to do all these. If collected in normal times and collected with paper, I'd want to look at them more, but it's impossible to hold you to this. But at least use ODE 4.5. At least use your ODE or numerical solver to get you know, a solution or two here maybe uh, put a starting condition equals a, a couple starting conditions and go through a loop and put a hold on, you know, put the hold on your graph so you get them all on the same graph, you know, something like this. That's what you'd have to do. You'd have to start, you'd have to have a, a, a vector of starting conditions and put them all on the same graph. By the way, last time I talked about some subtleties of ODE 4.5, and this reminds me, I believe if you do ODE 4.5, with a vector of starting conditions, it will give you the whole vector of answers. I think it's programmed that way to realize that some people might want that. So, um, but either way, if you had the will and the will to desire to do it, you could create the similar graphics that I created here. The, the top ones are very easy to create to just plot the thing. The bottom ones take a little bit more to create because you got to use OD45. But that's what I have in mind with that problem do what I did for those special cases. Take the equation at hand, create these kinds of, deduce this kind of information about this fixed points and stability and create these graphics having to do with the, the physical system and its solution and this, you know, the, the bifurcation diagram, you'll probably get one that looks like it, it might be going the other direction, I don't know, something, something like it. And uh, so that's what I have in mind there on those problems. And, um, where the heck are they? No. This one I asked me. Well, anyway, there we go. So, more extensive time on this chapter 10 would be really interesting because the problems are fascinating that you, when you get into the bifurcation ones, the other ones are interesting too, but this is just the math of it, but wow, oh, that's a nice little problem there. But like this improved laser problem where you got a more advanced copy of the, the biochemical switch, I thought that was a fascinating problem when I first solved it some years ago, that's why it's in my notes. It's a, it's a model of a gene, production of a gene and you know biological things. And it, it, it is one offering of an explanation on why a zebra has its stripes or the leopard has its spots and, you know, the gene and the products things. And, you know, I just, like I said, some years ago when I started reading things like this, having grown up doing like suspension systems on a car with spring mass, which again, I love that problem, but um, I just got fascinated that, oh my God, oh my goodness, look what else I could do with differential equations. Uh, what have I also got here? Oh, this one's a sick problem. It's not quite bifurcation. This this one's sick because 
This is a BVIC original. And, um, and, and, and the reason I say I need, I need therapy is because I was out at a beautiful trout stream, one of the beautiful, one of those beautiful trout streams in Virginia for sure. And I was fishing and I started thinking about differential equations and how it applied to this to the stocking of fish and the catching of fish. And I came up with this cool little problem on, on trouts, trout fishing in stock streams here in Virginia. So that's what I say, you got trout fishing, you shouldn't be thinking about there. But my mind turned differential equations. I came up with this fun little problem. This represents stocking. You know, they, the trout truck pulls up, and dumps some fish in, and a couple of weeks later, dumps up some more fish in. And uh, that's, that's a fun problem, fun, fun problem. Um, I have a whole sequence of problems. I've, I've included, I think, three of them here on fishing. Here's a nonlinear one on fishing when you, you harvest the fish at certain things. And here's an improved one on a complex model. They're interesting things. I've, uh, I mean, I have a whole set of more of these. I have a whole series of uh, fishing examples where the, the, the dependent variable, the, in, the independent variable is the number of fish or the number of, you know, things like that. And you put together all the things you know about the physical world to create these interesting models. Uh, differential equations, the world of differential equations is a fascinating world. It's amazing the amount of things you can model in addition to the mechanical engineering classics, which you will see continuously. Okay, so from here on, we got uh, one more day. Let me um, stop sharing. Oh, and um, we've got 150, 149 people, okay. Uh, anyway, well, I hope this semester has been as good as possible for you. I mean, it, it's really it's really a ripoff. It's really a ripoff. Um, not being able to go to like tailgates and you know all the social things you're missing in addition to the to clumsy way of, of producing classes. But you know we're all we're all in this together, you know, and we're all not giving up. I, I was talking about last time about about Jerry Rice from football, right? And how dedicated that guy was, and how how what an incredible work ethic he had, and things like that. Hardest worker ever in the NFL, you know hire extra wind conditioning coaches and, you know, have those cannons shoot 200 extra balls at him and, and da da da. Okay. So, you know, we can't all be like that, but have some inspiration. You know, Jerry Rice wouldn't have gone, Oh, there's a disease. I can't do my homework. That some bitch. He, he just do the like, professor. Can you give me more homework? Can you give me more to do? Can you give me another, you know, whatever, you know, he'd be in there. He want more. He wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't go crumble up. You know, so anyway, what does he say? And this is the, um, and for those that don't know what I'm saying, look up Jerry Rice on the internet. And also look up Jerry Rice work ethic. Look up uh, the history of Jerry Rice if you don't know what I'm talking about. And if you do, then um, be like him, if, if you can. Well, uh, professor. Can. So what's this, Jerry Rice to go. Yes, Jerry Rice was the goat. Uh, professor, can can we talk a little bit about the exam before you go or before we finish the class today? Because like, I don't want to be waiting till like two days before the exam to know like what kind of things we're going to be having. I'd rather like well, the topics. Um, we haven't finished making it up, and and as you know, it's going to be on uh, the exam. Will be up Wednesday. Class will be dedicated to reviewing for the course, talking about the exam, but. Um, to want more than a two-day lead-in is, is, a, is a fair fair request, I think. Um, what I'll what I'll do is make up a little, and all I always make up a little um, what you call it a summary, you know, list of topics for the final. I'll get that out to you as soon as possible, like today, hopefully sometime, so you have that at least before Wednesday's class. But you know, the major topics are calculus, um, linear algebra. Nonlinear algebra and ODEs; those are the four main mathematical topics. Running through all this, of course, is the programming part of the thing, the logic of programming, and we be able, hopefully, of gain some skill in MATLAB. So, some of the questions on those topics, like ODEs, will require you to have the skill to, to solve the ODE and then answer some questions about it. Um, the We've had a midterm exam, so the topics will be 
you know, if there was just one exam the whole semester, what I would do is, uh, what I would do is look, say, the percentage of time spent on each topic and try to make the, the, whole, uh, the topics that percent. However, we've had a, a midterm. So the topics will be a little bit, it'll be a little bit heavy since midterm, which means the exam will be a little heavier on uh, percent wise on the differential equations and um, what do we have, the nonlinear algebra we've had since the exam, the other exam. And, and, and of course we did a little uh, curve fitting and those kinds of things. Anyway, um, the exam is, um, is weak best. You know, when you go into an engineering class, you know, and you're supposed to figure out some really interesting and complex things, and you get a damn true false, false question, I mean, it's just weak. You know, which one of the following is not true? You know, uh, you know, A, B, C, you know, true, false, A, B, C, D, which of the following is false, which of the following is true? Um, what, you know, you solve the differential equation, the answer at time equal five is a number. When you ask for a number, uh, you, you know, that's all I can say about it. I mean, I guess for the students, it's kind of a good deal in a way. You get a chance to make a good grade and not know too much, but, um, you know, exams are no good this way, but that's what we're gonna do as best we can do. I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, are we going to need access to the to MATLAB when we're taking this final? Uh, yes. Okay. That's all. Because there's some questions. Well, yes, I would. Say, a lot of the questions you don't. I mean, there's a lot of there's like, which of the following statements is false or which of the following statements is true? There's a problem, you know, a couple problems like that, and there's oh, a couple problems on uh, I don't know whatever. But there's going to be some others where. Uh, you know, you take this differential equation, uh, you take the differential equation and what I think we're, yeah, I have to look at it, but I'm almost sure we got a question like, consider the following differential equation. The solution at time equals whatever, a number of five or five seconds is, and you fill it in. And you know, you get, you get an answer, you get a correct answer based on a number, you know, again, a, a weak, insufficient way to test engineering students but we don't just go, I mean, that's not folding up, oh, 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 you know. I mean, the best we can do, you know. Uh, but that's the flavor of the thing. I mean, it's on Canvas. What, the, what, what else can you do? Professor, can you go to figure 10.5? Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Nope, I sent the wrong one. Ten point five. There she is. Yeah, isn't the middle phase portrait incorrect? Shouldn't both arrows be pointing to the left because they're both negative? Ah, uh, make it bigger so I can see what I got there. Um. Yes. Okay, and then um, I think that's the same case for um figure ten point nine. Okay. Um. Thank you for pointing that out. The um, yeah, and and let me let me um, make a note here. Figure ten point five, the middle picture. You are absolutely correct. I'm just making myself a note here because you know when version two of the book comes out, I'm going to include your observation there. Um, and what's the other one that we did it? 10.9. 10.9. So the is, second arrow should be flipped, right? In the middle diagram. It's all the middle diagrams. Yeah. It's always the middle diagram that got messed up. So, yeah. So the middle end, this is figure 10.9. 
10.9. Yeah, I see that the, the, this, the one arrow is wrong on that one, not both of them. Okay. Um, again, two things. Thank you for pointing this out. Those, those subtleties will be corrected in the next vision. And also, thank you for actually paying attention to the details and, and you know, understanding what's going on and then paying attention to the details of the figure. You know? so thank also 10-11, too. 10, 11, okay. I computed, so, I, I created a little code to create these, figure 10, 11, the same kind of issue, same kind of issue there. Because the first, oh wait, maybe, oh, actually my version, no, never mind. This is incorrect, yeah. Because the thick part of the arrowhead yeah. is pointing to the right and yeah. it should so, be. So on 10, 11, the, I guess you can see it on my screen. That, it's hard to even see it, but like, oh. Think both arrowheads, it certainly looks like they're pointing the wrong direction. It's almost hard to say. So I need two things. I think I think they look like they're pointing the wrong way, but I need to make better. I need when next time I print this thing, I need to, to have the computer select better arrowheads that are clear which direction they are and have them point in the correct direction. Once I do that, so you know, creating all these figures and, and da 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 was you know quite quite detailed and I have a little program that does this automatically, you know, and um, I've got a little glitch in the algorithm that when it's just barely crossing it, the, the algorithm does it correct when the, it was below the critical or above the critical, but it's got a little issue right at these, right at was you're crossing these critical buckling point like values things here. Um, and that's, I mean, you know, next, there's never been a textbook printed. I think there was a hundred percent typo or some issue like this free. I'm going to make, I try, I don't want to make my second issue as close as possible, including your observations here. So thank you again. And also I had another question with regards oh. to problem 10, 13, for okay. that we're doing for homework. Okay, so we go over to it then over here, 10, 13, there it is. Yeah, so if you take the second ODE uh -huh. and you factor out an X, that gives you one. That's uh, there you go. Uh -huh. stable point right and then you're left yep. with the other side if you set that other side equal to the other, zero the other, you, it's not really the other side it's the other like the other um, piece the other piece, piece yeah. yeah exactly yeah. yeah if you set that equal to zero you get an expression and based off of like the way I was playing around with um, I guess I used I don't know if you know what Desmos is it's like an interactive graphing calculator that you can use online. I was playing around with the with the R values and it seemed like there were two points um, that were bifurcations, I guess, where like the this where a fixed point was either created or destroyed. But one of the points that I think is a critical value, um, zero in this case, doesn't behave like any of the examples in the book. So assuming I did it correctly, I don't know how to classify it. Because um, I was like comparing. Um, hold on just a second here. Let me, um... One time in my life, I worked out all that algebra. Let me look at it here. Okay, as, as you're pointing out, of, co of course, zero, you know, when you factor out this X, that's zero, and then, then the rest of the thing gives you X, it's the second X equal to some, you know, algebraic expression, right? Mm -hmm. And so- that's it second looks, algebraic expression when R is equal to zero, funky stuff happens and that doesn't you know, like, fit. Well, the, so, so the, therefore the, critical value of R is not zero in this case. It's something else. Okay, but is there not a qualitative change in behavior that occurs at zero? Well, I guess there is. So in the, the expression you came you had R in the denominator, right? So you can't put, if you put R equals zero, you get one over zero. So yes. I think this is more like, well, not spoiled, move, more like the laser thing where you know, when, when R reaches some kind of a critical value, the stability changes. And you can look at your, you know, your, your thing there. 
So that point, and as a matter of fact, if, if uh, yeah, it goes down like that. So, and, and, and this wasn't designated as a physical problem. So there's no reason X, can't, X itself can't be a negative number also, you know, like in the spring mass, X can be positive or negative. Yeah, you know, if this was applied to humans or something, negative humans wouldn't make sense, although it would mathematically. So X going negative is fine, but R equals zero um, is a problem because of division by zero. So maybe just consider R greater than zero and you still have a bifurcation in there. Okay, more. yeah, that makes it a lot easier. Yeah, I did the, bifur the bifurcation diagram with... Um, all, or I guess, yeah, I did the bifurc bifurcation diagram with all of the X's, like okay. from negative, to, negative infinity to positive infinity, and it looks a lot more complicated, but the portion of X that is just greater than zero, or wait, did you mean R greater than zero? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. The portion of the graph of the bifurcation diagram where R is greater than zero is very straightforward and matches what's in the book exactly. So yeah. that would be and, very helpful. Yeah, and the good, but R is good. Now, in some, so, so some, in some problems, the, the dependent variable X, like if it's, you know, like I say, if it's a number of people, like in our things model, it can't be negative. With, you know, with uh, other mechanical systems, it can be positive or negative. And then there's some parameters that make no sense if they're negative, like density, right? Or, I mean, there's a lot of physical parameters that were negative values that have no meaning, you know, volume or something. So um, it, we, we don't know what the application particularly is. Here, so there's no reason I suppose R couldn't be a negative value, but let's, let's restrict it to R greater than zero and then you'll match up with one of the things I think pretty easily there. Thank you. Okay, yes, you're quite welcome. Thank you.